In 2009, 20th Century Fox along with original Alien director Ridley Scott set out to make a return to the Alien franchise with what would eventually become Prometheus. At the very beginning of this journey, scriptwriter John Spates was brought in by Ridley's own production company, Scott Free, to look at some other film ideas when the idea of another Alien film was put on the table. The following discussion would lead John to the conclusion that the sequels had already been done to death, and that the only way to return to the story of the Xenomorph would be to go back to the beginning. Spates was quoted as saying, I said, well, you have to go back to the shipwreck where it all sprang. You'd have to look at that dead giant, the dead space jockey, the dead giant in the chair with the elephantine proboscis ribcage. The only issue here for John was the problem of how you tell the story of an alien who we can't understand without subtitles or having humans in all of the engineer scenes. Instead, John knew that in order to tell the story of these extraterrestrials, that their story inevitably had to be tied to our own story, the story of humankind. And with that first initial sit-down, Spates wrote out a quick outline of the story and called it Alien Zero One, The Master Narrative. This outline would launch the tale of the engineers as they stood in the mind of Spates, and how they would go on to create the human race which in turn would lead to artificial intelligence and then eventually to the possible early beginnings of the Xenomorph itself. So today, I want to take a look at these rarely mentioned first thoughts for the prequel franchise to see where our alien story begins. <laughs> to begin, let's break this down section by section. I've only ever seen any parts of the master narrative on the Prometheus Blu-ray extras, and I'd like to note that the blank spaces are words that were cut off on the edge of the screen, but with that out of the way, let's dive in. The Engineers, The Verge of Godhead So what does Godhead mean in this context? Online dictionaries show the word as divine in nature or essence, the essential being of God or the supreme being. So this is to say that the Engineers were originally meant to be much more advanced than what we saw of them in Prometheus and Covenant, with texts so advanced that they began to see themselves as gods or beings of ascension. It is not known if the engineers worshipped any deities or if they believed in some kind of higher power. One could wonder if they were agnostic, atheistic, or followed their own form of religion. We do know that the temple on LV-223 showed some kind of reverence to the Xenotype alien in the mural and to the engineer face in the same room, along with the ones in the headroom on Planet 4. The headroom faces are said to be the elders of the civilization, but the head in the ampule room and its murals are left more to interpretation. All of this would come well after the writing of the narrative, so all we can really take from this bit is that the engineers were close to becoming what they saw as gods, or at least joining them if that were the case. Their civilization is millions of years old. We already knew that the race was old, perhaps even tens or hundreds of thousands of years old, but millions of years is a much longer time, and one that would fit the amount of knowledge that these engineers were said to possess here in the master narrative. Once the engineers express themselves as humans do, taking pleasure in music, color, and story, but they've long since learned to see in more dimensions than we do. Their art and ornament exist on planes imperceptible to human senses. This passage makes me think of the deleted scene in Prometheus where the engineer is examining the art and other humanistic items in the escape craft at the end of the film. It also further expands on just how advanced these engineers really are, as we learn that they are able to see in more dimensions than we do. Just think of that and what kind of tech that would require. This also makes me wonder if this was something that they could do naturally or if they had modified their eyes to be able to do this, referring to the blacked out eyes of the last engineer in Prometheus. Their constructions look dark and grim to us, that the engineer's eyes see far more than our own. This passage is interesting to me not for the fact that they simply have a different design affinity than we do, but because it feels to me like an explanation for the giger art style that runs throughout the franchise one of biomechanics with the unnatural blending of living organic tissue and mechanical items. I'd really be curious to see how they view the world around them and just how much us humans aren't even able to see. Individual engineers live for 100,000 years. Ages ago, their race abandoned sex and gender, reproducing by more abstract methods. In recent millennia, they have ceased to reproduce altogether. Here we need to focus for a minute because this line has led to the biggest misconception out there concerning the engineer race. I've already talked about that fake Prometheus early fan-made draft that many of us have heard about. Well, this is where that misinformation most likely came from. 
So again, the master narrative states that the engineers lived for 100,000 years, and that long ago they abandoned sex and gender, reproducing by other methods, and that recently they have ceased reproduction altogether. Now for some reason a big chunk of the fanbase, including that fake scriptwriter, didn't read the outline very closely. They run with the idea that the engineers were somehow unable to reproduce anymore and that they were using the black substance as a way to produce offspring, which in its own makes no sense. Yet the paragraph clearly states that the engineers had abandoned sex and gender, not lost it. This was a choice of the engineers and not something that happened to them that they couldn't cure, at least in my opinion from what you read here. It would also be the only time that any kind of reproduction issues with the engineers would ever be mentioned again, and I'm including any of the early scripts by both scriptwriters, John Spates or Damon Lindelof. The only issue here is that even when you read the section of note, it's unclear just why any race of sentient beings would choose to end their natural reproduction abilities, unless newer methods prove more advantageous, but this question may be answered in the following paragraph. The engineers believe themselves to be on the verge of a transcendence in which they will abandon their physical flight into the 10 dimension multiverse as creatures of now perhaps here we have more information as to why the engineers thought they were on the verge of godhead, as it looks like the race had become so advanced that they were about to abandon their physical bodies and become something more like pure energy. They believe that this would enable them to ascend into the multiverse, a step closer to the state of divinity. Again, it's unclear if they saw this as a true religious divinity or simply as tech on the scale of a god. This also could lead to why the race would no longer need to procreate. If they were so close to losing their physical nature, then the older methods of reproduction would no longer be useful. Shepherded the human race toward sentience and civilization, DNA and their habitat, teaching humanity's teachers. We see that here, even in the first discussions of the engineers, that they were meant to be tied to the evolution of mankind. It isn't clear if shepherded is meant to explain the engineers created the humans or if they simply guided us and possibly altered the DNA of an already existing species, since this draft was done way before the mentions of matching DNA. We also learn that they supposedly taught humanity's teachers, although the next area is blank so it's not exactly certain just what was taught. I believe that this refers to the early visitations of the engineers that Ridley Scott mentioned during interviews before the theatrical release of Prometheus. In time they believe humanity would be ready to receive the engineers knowledge and move through the universe as the engineers did before them, perhaps someday to reach their own. I can't help but wonder if this passage isn't referring to the cave paintings that we see in Prometheus, pointing mankind to LV-223, although in the early scripts the trip would have been to LV-426, not 223. Did the engineers plan on humans being able to see the galaxy as they once did? If so, was this why they would in the later drafts point us to LV-223 or LV-426 to possibly give humans access to the black substance that would allow them to see the stars as they once did? Research station was set up on LV-426, a moon in nearby, Benefactor studied the problem of humanity and prepared. Now this is interesting because we find out that in the first ideas for a prequel, LV-426 was meant to be a research station for the engineers. It then notes that the engineers were studying the problem of humanity and preparing for something. So what was this problem of humanity? Could this also be some of the early religious references from those Ridley Scott Prometheus interviews that weren't used? We know from those interviews that some of the early ideas for the film had the engineers replacing the early religious counters on earth, and that even Jesus was possibly an engineer sent to help bring mankind in line until his death which would anger the engineers, causing their retribution. Ridley knew that these ideas couldn't be put to film, but I can't help but wonder if some of this still exists in the underlying untold story. So how do you feel about this original view on the engineer, with them being a much more advanced race than what we saw them in Prometheus and Covenant? I would be really interested to see where this idea could have gone if Spates would have taken this further without any outside influence. Would this have led to the fallen angel motifs that we heard about from those interviews? Did the engineers try to become godlike or ethereal and fail, leading to what we see now, dark engineers of Prometheus and the left behind engineers on planet 4? Did some of the race succeed and ascend to a higher dimension? And was the xeno-like alien in the mural an outcome of this failure? 
It really is too bad we don't have more information on these early ideas, and on that I'd love to hear your thoughts on this outline. And as always, your comments, likes, shares, and subscriptions go a long way towards helping the channel grow. Thanks again for watching, and I hope to see you next time.